Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar, Canister Application Level Data Operations on Kubernetes. I'm Libby Schultz, I'll be moderating today's webinar and I'm gonna read our code of conduct and then hand over to Michael Cade, Senior Technologist and Member of Technical Staff and Pavan, member of the technical staff, both with Cast in by Veeam. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee, but there is a Q&A chat on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to drop your questions there and we'll get to as many as we can. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct, and please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They will also be available via your registration link you used today, and the recording will be available on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand it over to Michael and Pavan to get started and kick off today's presentation. Thanks, Libby. Yeah, so so this session is going to be focused on an open source project called Canister. Um, just before we go into that, if we just go through the introductions again of of ourselves. So again, I'm Michael Cade from uh, I'm a senior technologist. I basically sit within our product strategy group um, within Veeam. Um, Obviously, a recent acquisition was around custom focused on Kubernetes data management. That's not what we're talking about. But ultimately, the focus around Kubernetes cloud native has been my focus, purely my focus for the last uh, six to eight months solely. And then before that, probably tinkering around, tinkering around, learning a little bit more around this space for the last two or three years. So that's that's me in a nutshell. Pavan? Hey all, uh, I'm Pawan. Uh, I've, I'm a member of technical staff uh, here at uh, Caston by Veeam. So for the last, uh, I think, three and a half to almost four years now, uh, I've been uh, solving data management problems for uh, mostly stateful apps on Kubernetes. Uh, I've also been kind of contributing to open source projects that are uh, related to data management and uh, one of them being Canister uh, that we are uh, discussing later today. Awesome. And Pavan's going to be the, the one focused on showing you the deep dive into the into the open source project, but also getting to show you how it works what it and what it does. Um, I, I'm going to go into a little bit of the the challenges and the the issues that we have from a data management, a broader data management space, and then how Canister can help with with some of those those issues. So if we go to the, the next slide, Pavan. And and really what I want to focus on here is is that data management challenge around cloud native first. I think from a day two point of view, or at least from a day one point of view, Kubernetes deployment, cloud native deployment is is relatively advanced. It's quite easy to go and deploy your your applicator, your Kubernetes clusters, your applications out there in, in the spaces where we're seeing more of the challenges is around day two. And whether that be data management, whether it be security or observability, it's definitely one of the, the top most topical challenges that we have within that within our space at the moment around protecting that or having visibility into the data, the management of that, the security of that, as well as having some visibility, the observability of that. And that really focuses on from a data management point of view around things like backup, but not just backup, obviously the recovery of that that data, disaster recovery, things still happen in this in in this platform, as well as being able to move quite freely those applications from one cluster to another and and or one location to another as well. And then as we look into the different applications that we have, especially around state for workloads where we're going to have that level of um, responsibility to protect that data is different data services. Now, not saying that we don't have these data, ser data services in other platforms, but there's a different way of looking at data services, especially when it comes to Kubernetes and how, how those data services are 
provisioned and how they're protected them from a data management point of view. But then that leads on to there are different storage technologies as well. We have our entry provisioners. We have our CSI drivers, different ways of being able to store our, our workloads, our data within or without, like even outside of the, the Kubernetes cluster as well. So some of the things that we have to consider are these layers of operations are are, are broader than what we maybe once had in a virtualization world, for example. And that's where we're going to just quickly uh, go over some of those, those areas. And then I'll get into a little bit more around um, some of the options that we have when it comes to data management. So the first and foremost, and this really aligns to any of our platforms, whether it is virtualization, as I know a lot of us are on this learning journey around cloud native, around Kubernetes, and it doesn't matter whether you're on virtualization, whether you're in a cloud-based work, a cloud-based environment, whether you're on Kubernetes, you're going to start with some physical storage, a layer of storage where you're going to store some some of your data. And that will be the spinning disk, the flash, the NVMe that is propping up the, the infrastructure underneath. So it's going to be running somewhere. And then similar to that, it depend, again, regardless of platform, you're going to then have that block file or object storage offering. And this will be the presentation. So whatever that platform is that you're, you're running, you're going to have that presentation layer that is going to take that physical storage and present that through to whatever that platform may be. And these are the two very generic areas that we're going to see across all of our platforms, regardless of where they are. Now, where it becomes relatively different is when we start talking about data services, and then even more so when we get to the stateful applications on the next bit. But data services, for, for the most part, when we think about databases, we think about NoSQL, SQL, but we also have to think about the messaging queues and those batch processing um, uh, workloads that require some stateful or state um, stateful data that we have to consider and we have to protect. So then we, and at that point, that's where we start looking at how do we protect that data and how do we do it specifically for that particular data service, whether it be MongoDB, whether it be NoSQL or MySQL, sorry, or any of the others that you see pictured on there. The other interesting fact here as well is that the data service doesn't necessarily have to run within the Kubernetes cluster or within the cloud native um, uh, cluster itself. It, it can be an external data service such as Amazon RDS, and but we still have to protect that workload, and we have to then have a have a more have a uh, better understanding of what the application that is using that data, so that we can protect all of the data and the application together, and that and that leads us on to, especially in a Kubernetes world, is that a stateful application is made up of many different areas, whether it be config maps, whether it be secret services, applicator pods, deployment sets, stateful sets, etc. And they all play a huge part in making sure that we have that scalability and how we how we leverage that that stateful application. So there's a few different differentiators or differences is when it comes to not only the data services, but the stateful application. Whereas if we were to look back at virtualization, for example, we would generally see one virtual machine with one data service, and we would then look to protect that whole virtual machine in one instance or one go. Now we're having to look at various different moving parts to be able to protect everything as well as the data service itself, because they all reside in different locations, potentially in different locations, but they serve a purpose in, in terms of that scalability and availability of that that workload. If we go down to the next one, Pavan. And then that leads us on to the next challenge. So one is the challenge about choosing where you want to store your data, like the choice of data services that best suits the application that you're running on. But then this leads us on to, okay, so now we've got different areas of or different flavors of data management. And we need to understand, well, what level of protection is, it, is enough? I are we going to be and that's what we're going to talk about over the next couple of slides is really first and foremost we need to be able to one take a backup because we need to be able to restore if and when there is a failure scenario to that now what that failure scenario looks like and what we can withstand within the environment 
very much determines what level of protection you potentially need, but also the importance of that data. And it's not just going to be a one size fits all when it comes to Kubernetes data management. You're going to potentially have different applications that require different SLAs and different service um, requirements when it comes to how do we get that how do we get that application back up and running as fast as possible if failure scenario A, B, or C was to happen? And then we've got the added options around this. Because of the nature of cloud-native workloads, we've got the ability to quite easily lift and shift and migrate those workloads, those applications from one cluster to another. And that might be based on a failure again, but it also might be based on migration. It might be based on performance. It might be based on... Um, scalability to or different options within maybe certain uh, public clouds. And then in the same vein to that application mobility, we have the disaster recovery use case. Fire, flood, blood all still happens from a from a platform perspective when it comes to Kubernetes or or any platform for that matter. So we have to consider that as well from a from a um, a data management point of view is. What happens if the worst was to happen in our in our production site and our production cluster was to no longer be available? What does our disaster recovery plan need to look like? And how do we get that data from A to B so that we can have that business continuity and, and keep things up and running? Then we had, as if that wasn't enough, then we had the uh, we have the added um, complexity around compliance requirements, regulations about keeping data. What data are we keeping? whilst all, all the time trying to keep this freedom of choice and making sure that we're choosing the right tool for the right job, the right platform for the right ask of what we need from an application point of view, but ultimately keeping that, that agnostic approach to being able to protect our data as and when we need to. And if we just go through some of these options um, for data management, and I'll, I'll touch on some of the benefits of them, but also some of the, maybe the, the best way to put it is some of the pitfalls of of some of those um, angles for for data management. If we go to the next slide, please, Pavan. So first and foremost, I would say that a large majority or a large percentage of that underpinning physical storage will carry some layer of or capability of being able to leverage storage centric snapshots, regardless of what platform we're running on. But let's say about we're we're looking at cloud native, we're looking at, at Kubernetes again now. And this is basically leveraging the underpinning storage system with no hook into the application itself. So it's very similar to pulling the power out of your, your desktop PC. And obviously, when that comes back up, it's going to look and feel exactly, hopefully, what it looked like as it went down. But it's a very dirty way of being able to have a point in time crash consistent copy of that data. Now, depending on your data service, that might be sufficient. That might be enough to have a really fast recovery point if your if your application can withstand that um, that that um, that process of of being able to take that uh, point in time crash consistent copy. But obviously, it's very dependent on the application and the file system of which your data is running. Now, this is going to be the fastest option because literally, it's going to be a copy of the the change blocks since the last snapshot and it's going to give you a very fast way of being able to recover those blocks as fast as possible but the biggest but on this is around it's on the same storage system as your production so yes it's a point in time copy it's crash consistent which is great if your application can withstand that but it's not going to give you any transaction transactional level um, or granularity of being able to recover that data Plus, if your failure scenario is your storage system is now no longer serving data, then your storage snapshots are also no longer storing data. So the the word of warning here is if this is this could be maybe used in conjunction with some other methods, but if this is enough, and maybe that's all you need to keep a day's worth of, of protection, because ultimately I don't need an off-site copy of this data because the data is only really used in one situation. This might be a, a valid way of being able to protect that, that workload. So if we go down to the, the, uh, the next one now, this is where it starts to get interesting. And this is where 
when when Pavan is is talking about canister later, this is really where the first hook comes from a from a canister point of view. So this is the same as what we just said about storage snapshots. However, now we're going to actually speak to the application and the data service, and we're going to put a hook in there so that we're making this now application, at least application consistent, so that we're going to freeze and flush the data services layer. We're going to initiate then the storage layer snapshot that we just spoke about. We're going to unfreeze the data services layer, and then we're going to record that completion and the status of that snapshot. Again, that's going to give us a really fast recovery point, but now we've got the added benefit of it being a little bit more consistent. However, we've still got the same problem that it's on the same storage as production. So at this point, we probably want to start thinking about how we move that data away from that production storage system as well into a, a different media type so that we've got a, a copy away from that, that, storage, that production storage system. So then if we start looking at, uh, well, how do we do that? This is where we start thinking about the data service centric point of view and how we take a copy of that data and then potentially store that into maybe a, a repository such as object storage or NFS or a file based location, just somewhere different to where our production workload resides. So this is then starting to focus on the database. It's starting to focus on the data service that we have within there. The key part to this, and this comes down to the recovery, is that this will have no dependency on the underpinning storage. Now, what this doesn't have is it can give you a level of complexity when it comes to recovery, because as much as this is going to give you the, the database and the specific tool set that allows you to protect that data, so a MySQL dump or a Postgres, a PG dump or or you name it, there's probably a built-in service to your data service that enables you to take a dump of that data. And with that, we've got a copy of that data. Now, when it comes to recover that, we've only got a copy of the database. We don't have the surrounding aspect to that application that maybe pulls upon or uses that data. And that's where that next layer comes in, where we want to be application-centric. And this is the focus about being able to capture everything under the application banner as it were so the front end the back end but also the data service that that we're wanting to be able to um, leverage and be able to restore from and what this allows us to do is have that freedom of choice but freedom of choice when it comes to recovery i want to be able to use those fast application consistent snapshots if it makes sense and the failure scenario doesn't involve an outage of my of my storage system but if not, I want to be able to work through and have an understanding of what that whole application looks like, especially when we look at Kubernetes where a you could have hundreds of different pods and hundreds of different um, persistent volumes and claims around that, that that hold that important data. Now, this will give us that, that level of consistency and that flexibility of picking and choosing what we actually need to recover and the granularity around that. And I think I then summarize some of these bits in the next slide. So there's four options. There's actually one more that we could we could have gone into around a dirty read and and around that that aspect. But ultimately, we and it will it will depend on what that data service looks like as to where and what your data management strategy looks like for your workloads. If a storage centric snapshot approach is is enough for that, and and it's going to give you um, a copy of that data, a very fast recovery point, but you don't have the uh, requirements to have that offsite or have that at least on a different media type away from that production, just in case the production storage was to fail. Then, if it is an application that requires that that post freeze and um, post thaw type operation then we've got the ability to be able to look into that or is that the, the capability of the strategy that we need? Then if we do need to take it out of band and onto a different storage layer, then we can do that by being able to take a copy of that data and storing that in our object storage, in our file system, external from the production storage. And then a full-blown um, like overview of your whole application is really focusing on how do I protect the whole application at the same time to give us all of the options around um, flexible recovery. Now, that's hopefully 
bringing up the the data management challenge that we have both from a wider platform point of view, but also from a Kubernetes point of view, cloud native point of view. But I think what what we should do now is is maybe take another look into um, the need for application consistency. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Pavan, who's who's been heavily involved from a from a canister project point of view, and he can explain a lot in a lot more detail than I can around what canister is, what it does, and how you can get involved and and what it does. Over. Uh, so we just discussed like different layers of uh, data protection and uh, me uh, and also different uh, like shortcomings of crash consistent or storage centric snapshots. Uh, if you uh, like go back and look at some of our slides before, uh, I think Michael had like a big butt with uh, storage consistent snapshots. Uh, they don't really talk to uh, the application or uh, are not aware of what's happening in the application itself. So uh, when you think about those things, uh, the need for application consistent data management arises. And it could also be uh, other requirements like um, we have some data services running and uh, we want to use uh, the internal tools that the data service provides like MySQL dump or PG dump, et cetera. Uh, if we want to use those and uh, or we have external uh, data services like Amazon RDS, uh, we want to protect those uh, or even if our uh, data service is in the form of an operator, uh, most likely uh, the data management comes uh, in the form of uh, CRs or custom Kubernetes custom resources. So we would be able to uh, uh, protect those as well. And uh, at the same time, we I think we discussed uh, about some of the hooks that we can have to freeze and unfreeze the data services. And uh, finally, we could also be uh, uh, requiring, uh, I, I, I think, advanced scenarios where uh, we need to, uh, I mean, uh, an example here is uh, MongoDB secondaries. If we have a replica set with multiple uh, uh, nodes and multiple uh, clusters here, we would want to take backup of uh, secondaries and stuff like that. So these are some of the needs that we have learned uh, while uh, developing Canister. Uh, and apart from that, the I think the protection workflows are also complex. So uh, different folks in uh, working on, uh, let's say, different uh, uh, sides of things where uh, you have Kubernetes cluster admins and uh, application developers or database administrators, they all have the same requirements of uh, protecting the application, but they don't have the same expertise. So a cluster admin may not know the internal workings of a database always. Uh, how do you uh, generally put together all these concerns and uh, have like a single way of protecting all kinds of applications. So uh, they are, I mean, these are some of the complex workflows. Then once you have figured out how to protect an application, then you have different moving parts. Like uh, in terms of infrastructure, uh, you could be uh, using an object store or you could be using a vendor targets or a file storage uh, uh, for your uh, backups. Then uh, again, we spoke about types of backups. Uh, some someone may want to use uh, like logical dumps or logical backups of the data service, or someone else would want to use uh, volume snapshots. Uh, while also doing that, we would want to handle the uh, life cycle of an application. What if the uh, the workload is up or uh, it's down uh, during the backup? What when do we uh, need it to be running and when do we need it to be uh, like frozen or scaled down in terms of Kubernetes workloads. Uh, so uh, bringing this all together, like if we think about all these requirements and the workflows, uh, we came up with Canister to kind of put all these together in one particular framework uh, to allow uh, all different uh, users and different uh, goals to be accomplished using like a single mechanism. And as it says here, uh, 
if we want to capture different uh, requirements from different uh, experts across um, the infra team or the developers or the database admins, uh, we want to provide a way, uh, a common way to perform like backup and recovery tasks across these teams and uh, also uh, be able to share each uh, like share their workflows with each other and extend them in case uh, they require that so uh, bringing this all together uh, i think canister is a tool that allows these things to uh, work seamlessly um, in kubernetes way or in a standardized uh, api uh, could be used to do these things so uh, let's actually move into canister and discuss more uh, about canister. Uh, what is canister? It's it's a framework for application level uh, data management. Uh, it's mostly made up of uh, four main components, the canister controller, blueprints, action sets, and profiles. So the canister controller is uh, nothing but it's based on Kubernetes operator pattern. It's mostly responsible for uh, the state management of these custom resources that we have here, uh, the blueprints, action sets, and profiles. And uh, a blueprint is, uh, like we discussed, it kind of defines the workflows for your uh, backup, restore, or delete operations. They, it could be other operations as well, which we'll see later. But uh, mostly, if we want to define backup workflows for a particular data service or a particular workload on Kubernetes, uh, blueprints are used for that. Now, once we have uh, operations and workflows defined in blueprints, uh, we use action sets to uh, run those actions or mostly to inform the canister controller on which action to run and uh, from which blueprint on, let's say, on which work workload and stuff like that. Now, finally, we also have profiles. Uh, these are mostly used to uh, define target uh, destination for our backups, or they could also uh, be uh, used to define the sources for our uh, restore operations. So apart from these, uh, the components that we discussed just now, uh, we uh, also provide a couple of tools uh, or command line tools along with canister. Uh, so can cuttle is uh, uh, it's a it's a small tool that uh, we can use to create these uh, the CRs that we discussed. Mostly action sets and uh, profile CRs can be created using can cuttle. Now uh, we also have this uh, tool called can do. Uh, this is mostly used to uh, uh, move data to and from an object store location. So it's uh, generally uh, used inside blueprints and uh, requires like a container, a specific container called uh, canister tools to uh, run this. So uh, we, have all, we have seen all these uh, different components. We can actually go through some examples and uh, uh, dive deep into some of these uh, specific components. Now, uh, what we see here uh, is an example blueprint. Uh, it's a simple blueprint. I haven't added uh, uh, very complex workflows here. Uh, so as I described earlier, uh, Blueprint is used to tell the canister controller how to backup or uh, restore an application. Now, this is done through actions. And uh, these actions actually contain one or more uh, phases. And uh, as we see here, each phase can uh, have like a canister function. Uh, it, it is a primitive that. Uh, we use to execute, let's say, backup, uh, sorry, bash scripts or uh, shell scripts, or it could also be used to uh, take volume snapshots and stuff like that. Uh, I'll cover canister functions um, in, in some time, but uh, let's go through this example. Here, uh, what we see is, uh, is a MongoDB blueprint, and the main action shown here is a backup action. And uh, here, the output artifacts are mostly used to uh, store state from a backup action. So once we execute any backup action, we would want to store some state. In, in terms of uh, most of these uh, data service backups that uh, 
we have here uh, it it would most likely be a path in in from our uh, object store so uh, the path we see here is the uh, path that we can find inside our object store bucket that uh, I, I'll cover how we can provide that, but uh, that is what we are storing here. And the phases we see here, there is a single phase and the function, the canister function called uh, coop task is used here. Now the function itself spawns a pod in the namespace that is provided here and uh, with a container of image that is also provided here and uh, finally executes the bash command that we have provided. So uh, the command here, you can see we are using uh, Mongo dump here to uh, capture the data from the MongoDB replica set. So uh, this is uh, a simple blueprint. Now, once we have uh, the blueprint defined, how do you tell the con uh, controller uh, that uh, we want to execute a particular action from a blueprint? So that's when we uh, deploy an action set now, again, if you see the spec of the action set, uh, it contains mostly uh, details about what action to run from which blueprint or the subject for the action. Uh, the subjects are mostly uh, Kubernetes resources. And uh, then finally, we also have a profile that can act as a source or a destination for that operation. Uh, so here in this example, uh, act, we are selecting the backup action from the blueprint uh, which uh, we just saw, the MongoDB, uh, MongoDB blueprint. And then we are uh, selecting a resource to run the action on, that is the stateful set of uh, MongoDB replica set. And uh, it's assuming that it's also deployed in the namespace MongoDB. Now uh, the profile example profile is being used. Uh, so once this action uh, set is submitted to the canister controller and the action itself is executed. The controller then sets the status section of the action set. Um, it updates whatever information uh, uh, we, we have provided in the output artifacts in the blueprint, if you uh, remember that. Uh, it stores that uh, the artifact value there. And at the same time, it also kind of shows us the progress of each of the phases from the blueprint. Uh, we'll we'll uh, see that when we actually see a live demo. Uh, but uh, we do get a constant view of uh, the status in the system. So if a, if a particular phase is in progress or it's completed, uh, for every uh, change in state, we see an update in the action set. Uh, moving on to a profile, uh, we just saw how a profile uh, is used to define a target location for our operation, but what does it contain? So if we look at this example, um, the profile itself contains two main components. First, uh, an object store location. Uh, in this case, it's an S3 compliant or an Amazon uh, S3 bucket called uh, canister backup. Then once we have this bucket, now we would need the credentials also uh, to uh, communicate with that bucket. So that's where the uh, credentials comes in. Now, uh, there are a few different ways of providing credentials, but the one that I have used here uh, is called a key pair. It's uh, selecting the IDs that we, ID field and the secret field that we have provided from uh, the secret reference that we can see here. So uh, in this case, it's actually uh, taking the credentials from the example key ID and example secret access key that you would be able to find in the example secret. So if we go and dig into the secret, we would see those fields and uh, the value set. So it's kind, uh, kind of a secure way to provide credentials so that they are not uh, exposed anywhere. Uh, so now, uh, now that we have seen all the different components, how do they uh, interact with each other uh, during the execution of a particular action? So uh, assume a database workload, a blueprint, and a canister controller are, uh, are already deployed on a particular cluster. So how do we back up this uh, particular database workload? The first thing 
we would do is uh, create an action set. And like we saw in the example, the action set uh, should be defining the action from uh, this blueprint. It should select this blueprint and uh, let's say a backup action from this blueprint. And it also needs to provide the database workload as its uh, subject and also select a target destination if required. Now, once the action set is created, uh, the controller, which is um, constantly watching or polling for creation of action sets, uh, looks at it and finds all the actions and uh, the blueprint that we have provided there and it goes and fetches the action from that blueprint uh, just uh, as we saw in the blueprint example uh, uh, maybe i can go back to it for a bit let's see so here uh, one more thing we saw was that uh, the namespace is provided as a go template uh, this is uh, actually a way to kind of generalize a blueprint. We can have a single blueprint and uh, we can use that blueprint across uh, different objects in the cluster. So uh, if we have multiple deployments of uh, MongoDB replica set in the cluster, the same blueprint can be used for that. So uh, like I said, it goes and fetches this, uh, whatever action the action set provides. Uh, and it kind of renders all these uh, Go templates. We would want the values from the, the object that is being used there. So the controller goes and does all these things, uh, fetches the actual action, and then it uses the canister function that we have provided in the blueprint to interact with the in, uh, database workload. The function actually uh, determines the uh, the steps or the commands necessary to perform a backup for this database workload. And uh, once we have executed those commands or uh, uh, if, it's, if it's taking a volume snapshot, uh, once we have done that, then uh, the function can also decide whether uh, it wants to store this uh, data in an external uh, S3 or an object store uh, bucket. So that is, uh, de determined by the profile provided in the action set. So uh, once all these things are executed, the data is moved out of the cluster into the object store. Uh, the controller then comes back and sets the status on the action set that we saw in the example. So the status will then have the location uh, information about the snapshot from the bucket. And it also constantly updates uh, each phase uh, status and uh, th that's how like a work the whole workflow is uh, once we have a successful action set we would know that uh, the backup has been uh, su uh, successfully taken so uh, we have seen how uh, canister works in theory uh, we can actually look uh, look at a live example and see how we can use canister to protect uh, MongoDB replica set on a live cluster. Let me actually share my screen. Okay. So let's start with uh, looking at the cluster that I have. So I have a GKE cluster uh, with uh, 121 Kubernetes version. Um, and I've also deployed MongoDB here. Uh, in the namespace Mongo, let's check what, if everything is running fine there. Yeah, so uh, things are running fine here. What we can do is I have not added any uh, data here. So uh, we could go ahead and add some data there. What I'll do is I'll uh, execute or run kubectl exec into the pod that we see here. And 
I think it should have a Mongo client there, which I'll use to execute or um, add some data there. So I've, I'm uh, creating a database uh, with uh, some restaurant uh, entries here. So I have added some four uh, entries into the database. And uh, we can actually confirm whether all of them got added. Yeah, uh, so we see four entries here. So uh, the database is set up with some data and uh, it's actually running on this cluster. Now, um, what we can do is actually see how simple it would be to deploy canister and protect this uh, data database. I, uh, I'll create a new namespace where I can uh, deploy canister. So the namespace got created. Now, uh, if we uh, see canister documentation, uh, we do provide uh, commands to deploy canister using Helm. I'm actually copying uh, the command from there and uh, let's just install that. Pavan, can we just zoom in a touch, mate? Just so, so that we can see it a little bit clearer. Is this better? Maybe go one notch first. Yeah, there. That might be better. Okay, so uh, we just installed canister. You can check if uh, all the pods are up there. Yeah, so the controller is uh, running in this canister namespace. Uh, next thing I would do is uh, just install the tools. Uh, the can cuttle and uh, can do tool that uh, I talked about earlier. There is an uh, 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 a simple command to actually uh, just uh, install these. I'm going to run that and let's see. Cool. So I think we have those installed now. Let's confirm that and yeah. I, I provided this uh, 068.0, which is our uh, most recent release. So uh, so we have can cuttle from that version. Now, uh, one thing we talked about was a profile or um, a destination for uh, these backups. What I'll do is uh, create a profile with uh, my S3 credentials. I have already set up a bucket uh, so it should work. Yeah, so the profile got created and the secret we see here uh, is nothing but the secret where our uh, credentials are stored. And the profile just uh, references that secret. So we have that, we can just confirm So what we see here is that it's referring to this secret that got created and the bucket uh, that I have created for this demo. So uh, now uh, we have the profile set up, we have the controller set up. The next thing would be the MongoDB blueprint. Uh, this blueprint is one of the many examples that we have uh, in our uh, repository or you could find them in canister docs as well uh, i'm going to directly use that blueprint from our uh, github so let's create that and add that to canister uh, namespace so it's called mongo uh, mongodb blueprint can actually check uh, what phases it has. So the one I showed before was a very uh, simpler or a simple version of the same blueprint. So uh, we see here that it has a uh, backup action. And uh, again, similar to what we saw, uh, saw in the example, we have uh, an output artifact. And under the phases, we can see that uh, the coop task is uh, the the phase itself is called take consistent backup. 
uh, it's using mongo dump here once the mongo dump creates a snapshot of the database we are using uh, actually the can do command to uh, push it to an object store so uh, can do has this uh, sub command called location push which takes that data from the mongo dump and just uh, streams it to the s3 location that we have provided here so there's also a delete uh, delete action here uh, in in the blueprint this is nothing but uh, it can be used to delete your uh, the snapshots that you, you have taken in the backup uh, phase uh, there's one thing that uh, that both uh, restore and delete have in common that is the input artifact so the artifact that we created here actually stores the location of the backup right so uh, we provide that to these two uh, actions uh, as a part of the input artifacts so now we see the cloud object from here being passed into these uh, phases or actions now again restore is uh, using mongo restore it's using the opposite of uh, it's just doing the opposite of what the backup phase did using can do location pull uh, to stream data back and then using the mongo restore to restore that data back into the replica set so this is mostly the blueprint now uh, i think we have everything set up how do we protect the data that we have in the mongodb so uh, as we discussed earlier we need to create uh, an action set point to the backup action from the mongodb blueprint so before that let me just con confirm the profile that we have So I'll be using uh, the can cuttle tool to create an action set. So it has this command called uh, create and uh, we are providing action set as the option there. Now I can select the action. I can uh, select which namespace the action set should be deployed in. And I'm also selecting the blueprint here. And this stateful set acts as the subject for the blueprint action. So I selected my uh, MongoDB replica set. And finally, we also have to provide a profile if required. In our case, we'll, we'll use the profile which we created earlier. Cool. So now the action set got created. What we can do here is use uh, describe to uh, see what is happening in that action set. So, okay, cool. I think it looks like it's already done with the backup. So just to explore the action set, uh, what we have here is the blueprint, the action, the object that we selected and the profile that we uh, provided. Now, if you see the status section, um, it's actually complete now. If we see the state, it's completed. So um, this it had like phases uh, from the blueprint that uh, that are now complete. And we also add events at uh, regular intervals to see uh, how the action set is progressing. So in case these things were, um, I mean, if we had larger data and uh, if the operations were taking longer, we would see uh, each of these states uh, getting updated one after the other. But in our case, since uh, it was uh, uh, pretty quick, we uh, weren't able to see that progress, but if you see all the events here, uh, we have already updated and completed the action set. So now uh, we have uh, the data created or uh, backed up. What we can do is uh, actually verify, uh, let's see if this location has the file. So what I'll do is uh, use S3 command to verify that from my location. This the command there. Yep. So if we see here, this file just got uh, created when we ran the action set. So now uh, everything is set up. Uh, the backup is done. Uh, what I'll do is I'll simulate a failure or uh, a disaster. Let me uh, go back into the pod that we had for Mongo. 
and I'm actually uh, dropping or deleting all the tables that I created earlier. Okay, so we just deleted the data. And uh, verify once if everything is gone. So it looks like the table is gone. Now, uh, how do we uh, recover this? So there is an easy way to uh, create an action set actually to uh, to uh, run the restore operation uh, from the previous uh, backup that we pro uh, just took. So let's let's again use uh, can cuttle tool to create that. And if you see here, uh, oops. Uh, what we have here is a from uh, flag that you can provide. And let's take the backup uh, name here. So uh, what it does is uh, takes the output artifacts from the previous action and uh, provides that as uh, input artifacts into the restore action. So let's create that. And again, we can uh, check whether things are running fine. Cool. So we see here that uh, it completed the phase from the restore action. Uh, it's called pull from blob store. Uh, again, it's used the S3 profile that we provided uh, in the backup and the same stateful set subject and the location which it got from the output artifacts from the backup. So now that we have actually recovered everything, we have to, I think, uh, let's just uh, verify the data once. Let's go back into our Mongo and verify if my tables are back. Yep. So we see the, uh, the entries that we had just deleted above uh, came back after the restore action. So, uh, I mean, that was pretty much it. That was how uh, we could just uh, restore uh, the Mongo in case of a uh, in case of a disaster. Uh, it was as simple as that. Uh, just once you have the blueprint, it's all about uh, creating action set and executing these actions. There's also one more um, action that we have, uh, the delete action that we saw in the blueprint. I can actually uh, show that as well. So it, we just use the can cutter to create um, action set for action restore. It's This is very similar. In this case, uh, we again use uh, action as delete instead. Let's provide the profile and let's provide the from that we used, which is nothing but the backup action that created the output artifacts. So one more thing to notice here is that uh, we run these uh, delete operations. Uh, we don't need, a, when we run these, we don't need a subject. So we don't really have to provide this MongoDB as a subject. Instead, you can actually say, uh, uh, since it was a coop task that spins up a pod, you can select the namespace where that pod has to uh, come up. That is the that is used by uh, or that is provided by this flag here, which is a namespace targets. So let's create that. Again, we can uh, verify the status there. Cool. So that has completed the phase delete from blob store. Now, one thing we ran earlier was the AWS uh, S3 command. We uh, see now that the file is gone. So this is how we can actually, the delete operation is useful when uh, we want to maintain a certain number of snapshots. And uh, if you want to uh, delete or retire some of those older snapshots, we can use these uh, delete operations. So uh, that was pretty much it, I think. Uh, uh, we saw how uh, we used the canister to uh, recover from our uh, disaster on the MongoDB.
uh, one thing we noticed there was we uh, used uh, the cook task function. So that is one of the many functions that we have uh, in canister. Uh, if we see uh, here, we have uh, a lot more functions and uh, options available uh, to be used in the blueprints. Uh, for uh, executing like shell scripts or uh, like bash commands and stuff like that, we can use these uh, these three functions that we see here under custom logic. Uh, kube exec is one of the uh, more important ones uh, here. Uh, this actually uh, works as if you were uh, running kubectl exec on a particular pod and a container, but uh, through a blueprint. So you can automate that process and provide a command to uh, execute on a particular container or a or a pod. Now for a resource lifecycle, where we talked about earlier, if we want to scale uh, scale up or down a particular workload, uh, we have functions for that. Then we have uh, functions that handle PVCs. Here we see backup data, restore data. These functions mostly uh, go and uh, perform uh, volume or uh, file system based uh, operations. Uh, so we could uh, mount a PVC on a particular pod and go into the uh, PVC volume volume there and uh, whatever uh, file system it has underlying uh, there, we could pro run some operations on that. Then there's also functions to uh, automate the process of creating volume snapshots. Uh, these could also be used in a blueprint uh, like with other restore and delete snapshot op uh, functions. Now uh, we talked a bit about uh, RDS. Uh, there are functions available right now in canister to create uh, RDS snapshots, restore them or delete them. There's also one more um, function that we have where uh, in case you want to move your uh, data out of RDS into let's say some other uh, provider where you have deployed uh, Postgres, uh, this function is actually helpful. You can uh, take the data out and move it out into a, a non-RDS Postgres as well. So uh, those were some of the functions that we already have. I think this may not cover everything that we have, but most of them. And these could all be used in Blueprints today. And uh, we can also find examples of uh, how these are used. And uh, to talk about some of the providers that we support, uh in terms of uh, object store uh, canister allows uh, creation of profiles with uh, these object store uh, providers uh, mainly uh, s3 azure blob and google uh, cloud storage uh, the point i uh, have here s3 compliant uh, it just means we can have uh, something like minio or uh, something that is compliant to s3 apis then um, if we do want to take uh, snapshots of entry providers or uh, volumes that we have, uh, 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 I mean, we spoke about storage centric snapshots. Uh, there are uh, helpers out there in Canister. So Canister can actually be uh, used as an SDK and these uh, helpers or the functions that we have for creation of snapshots or creation of volumes from snapshots, they can be used uh, in whatever uh, uh, software you're using. Uh, it, uh, I mean, as long as it's uh, Golang based, you can uh, import canister and use these functions. So uh, that was most of what I wanted to cover. Uh, Michael, do you want to talk about uh, some of the new features that we are coming, uh, I mean, that are coming in the near future? Yeah, I think uh, awesome demo and, and really deep dive there Pavan. really good um so one of the things that we're working on if they're not already in the in the in the project is different file storage destinations for different backups obviously if we're moving data from a to b we want to be focusing on one security around encryption secondly dedupe and compression so that we can get data much more streamlined and efficient from a to b and then also other data services seeing a, a, an increase of data service operators out there, one being um, Kate Sandra, 
but there's others out there as well that that canister has the ability to to start protecting as well um so they're either on the roadmap or recently added to to canister and i think as a takeaway the next slide i think is just ha uh, maybe the, do, let's go to the next one Pavan. it's just easier to to shout this one um i think from from our point of view all the slides will be available I think my biggest ask is take a look at the project, see what how it can help you. Feedback contributions, like raise an issue, give us some give us some ideas about where 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 it could be used, where you're using it. Spreading the word, but then also um, just understanding what data management tasks are out there and how and when to when to choose canister or to potentially look at other data management tools in that in that area. And I think with that we can we can close out all right thank y'all so much i have posted our public slack channel um for online programs in the chat so if anyone wants to continue the conversation after this feel free to hop into that and shoot out any other questions you have um thank you so much michael and pavan for a great presentation and Unless there's anything else, we will see y'all next time. All right. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thank you both so much.